Thank you so much for coming. I love being at Reason Conf US. I feel like we're making history here. This is the first Reason Conf US. And I also want to acknowledge there's like one thing, or rather, a certain someone between you, all of you, and the after party. That is me. <laughs> so I'm going to try to go as smoothly as possible, keep you engaged all through this. Uh, so here we go. Uh, this is infinitely scalable native Reason apps on AWS, Lambda, and Zyte now. Um, I know we just hit buzzword bingo right there. Um, but I'm really going to talk about all of this. Uh, my name is Antonio. Uh, I work a little bit here and there um, on the Reason parser and printer. Uh, I really enjoy doing that. I feel like it helps all of you. Um, this talk is uh, a somewhat more extended version of the talk I gave at ReasonConf in Vienna during the, the open stage, uh, the open mic sessions. Um, and I'll make the slides available uh, later. There will be like a couple links here and there that you can click if you're interested later. Uh, well, let's, let's get started with a story. So one of the things that I derive the most pleasure um, in is just during the weekend, just being one with my couch, just sitting on the couch, hacking on something, something really fun or that, is, that I'm either going to share with the world or something that is not fun or some, something that is only fun for me and it's never going to go anywhere. Um, one of the latest things that I've built is a way to see anybody's uh, GitHub feed. Uh, so if you didn't know this, GitHub actually publishes an Atom feed for every user um, on like github.com slash uh, username dot Atom. Um, and sometimes I want to stalk people, all right? Um, and, and, and so I built something that allows me to read like some, some user, username's feed, um, you know, do some data wrangling here and there to convert from the, 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 the Atom format to JSON, send it over to the client. Um, and this is actually built with BuckleScript. Uh, I upgraded to BuckleScript 6, by the way. It's running very smoothly. I like it. I encourage you to do the same. Um, and then some, some uh, so this is an example of something that I think it's fun, but probably not useful to anyone else. Um, something that I built recently that I think it is fun, but also useful for my wife is um, she has like this, uh, she has uh, certain digital products on a platform. This is a Brazilian platform called Hotmart. Um, and she wanted to know when, when, when certain events happen, like when people subscribe to her products on, or, or like when they cancel their subscription so that she can reach out to those users. Um, and, and so I created for this uh, small thing that listens for incoming webhooks on this platform and sends her an email whenever important events happen. Um, anyway, point is, I, I love playing with different tech. I, I like trying new things out, um, creating these uh, sometimes one-off small projects. Um, both for myself and the ones I love. Um, but increasingly, and, and I, I feel like um, somehow uh, the, the, star, the plan is aligned because Sean also like, placed a, an iceberg on, on, on his talk. And, and so he was kind of talking about the, the, the application code and how, how, how you know, we like writing application code. And my point is, um, you know, whenever I want to share these creations, these things that I think are so useful and so fun with the world, um, it can some, come some, sometimes it can feel like the, the real work hasn't even started. Uh, and so sometimes we are done writing our application code and then that's like the entire code that we have to write to deploy our code. And you know, for the, you know, no, don't get me wrong, like playing with infrastructure is fun and all, but there's a time and a place for everything. Um, and for, you know, the less and the more experienced the like, uh, it sometimes can feel really, really daunting to set up all the infrastructure to deploy some code that either we're never going to use or didn't even take us that long to write in the first place. Um, so my, my, my uh, hypothesis here is that um, this big monster that is sometimes infrastructure can hinder experimentation. Um, and I think Experimentation is something really valuable, and we'll come back to this. Um, and so sometimes, you know, I'm sitting in my couch uh, during the weekend, and I've done this in a couple hours, and then trying to deploy something, and there goes our weekend. Um, and so I think, I think that we can do better. Um, 
Uh, yeah. So I, I, I want to. I've been asking myself some questions. Is like, what if we didn't have to worry about deployments, um, you know, or servers, or scaling? So there's this thing called serverless that's been going around for a couple of years. Um, you might have heard about it. It was Lambda uh, in 2014. Uh, announced their Lambda service, and I think they pioneered their serverless concept. Uh, I don't know if this is actually true, but I've heard the best way to learn things is to be wrong on the internet, um, so I'm sure someone will correct me. Um, you know, other vendors have since added support for um, basically what they call functions as a service, and but AWS really, like, remains a clear leader in the space, and, like, a lot of people are targeting AWS Lambda to run these... Um, little services that are run as functions and they, they handle all the, all the rest for you. Uh, po point is, you know, you can deploy code without thinking about servers, abstract away, basically abstract away the deployment target. Like, we don't have to think about where our code runs, how many instances are running at a given point, how do we scale them up? Like, if this thing that I built hits, like, the Hacker News front page, or scaling it down during nighttime so that I don't have to pay for, for you know, how many instances are required to serve that traffic. Um, what are the right? Yeah, what are the heuristics for for fi figuring this out? We don't, and, and so by, by by not worrying about where our code runs, or how many how many copies of our code um, run, or these heuristics, we can just let the service providers worry about this. Um, and so I want to say that, you know, something I really like about Lambda and basically the, the, the function as a service concept is it has a strong focus on application development. So it gets a thumbs up. I really like this. All right. Um, I th uh, something that I also really like is that you really only pay for what you use. Um, so this also gets a thumbs up. Uh, so to go in, into a little bit more detail into this is you only pay, I think, the, the, on AWS for like 100 millisecond intervals. So like if your Lambda runs for 200 milliseconds, you get billed just, you know, two times whatever it costs per 100 milliseconds. And, and, and it's really cheap if you're running on uh, um, these uh, somewhat low traffic um, services. And we can go a little bit in, into more detail about this later. Uh, but something that, you know, I quite didn't like was that only, historically only a handful of languages were supported, uh, and namely, yeah, uh, until there was JavaScript, you could run Node.js on on AWS, and you can run GoLang, Java, Python, Ruby, C Sharp, and you know, don't ask me why. For some reason, also PowerShell. <laughs> um, yeah. Does anyone see a language missing here? <laughs> like it might even be in the title of this conference. Yeah, this gets a thumbs down. I really, or like, I've been experimenting with OCaml and Reason for the past couple of years. I really wanted to, you know, deploy these fun projects on AWS Lambda, like, so that I don't have to worry about them. Uh, and then last November, something really cool happened. Uh, they, AWS has this really big conference, I think, in Vegas every year called AWS reInvent. And they announced support for custom runtimes. So this gets three thumbs up because I really like this one. Um, and what they did is basically they announced their Lambda runtime API. It's, uh, it's, uh, what, what, what this really is is a, what they call a simple interface to use any programming language or a specific language version because sometimes you couldn't use certain Node.js versions. Um, and so you, 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 you now, by making this API available, could could use anything that you wanted, as long as you implemented it. <laughs> uh, and this is actually the central point of the central point of this talk. Um, I was very interested to see how I could use this to my advantage and to do my OCaml work on AWS Lambda. And okay, I built something. I um, I went in, I looked at the reference implementation that they released. Uh, at the time, it was I think they released a Rust implementation. Um, I looked at Ox. Uh, it wasn't that hard to build, and I'll, 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 I'll tell you why. Um, so like, like, how does this even work at all? What, what, what is this? So the Lambda Runtime API is just an HTTP API. 
We all know how to query HTTP APIs, right? It's just a client so that pulls for events. And get this, you deploy the runtime with your own function. You compile this one binary that has your own service, your own, your single function, and the runtime embedded in it. And the runtime, all you have to do is start the runtime. It begins pulling for events. It always handles everything for you. They handle you, they handle you the events. You just gotta, you know, extract the payload, pass the inputs to the function that, that, that you wrote, get those outputs, and post the result. It should be posted result back to AWS. So this is what the Lambda runtime that I wrote handles so that you don't have to write that part. You, you can focus on writing your functions. Additionally, AWS Lambda freezes and thaws uh, the instances that are running your code. Um, so this polling really isn't polling because whenever you start polling, there's al already an event waiting for you. And then when you, like when you finish posting the result and you kind of go to the beginning of the while loop, you don't really go there and you only execute that code when AWS already has another event for you. I don't, I, I don't fully understand how this works. So it feels like magic at this point. All I know is it works, and I'm going to show you um, and why I think it's really cool. So to recap, you pull Lambda Runtime API for events, you get an event payload, you call a function that the user provided, you get a result, you post this to the Lambda Runtime API, and you repeat. And the way you use it is you consume AWS Lambda, uh, AWS Lambda OCaml runtime, which is the package I wrote. As a library, you write your Lambda function in terms of input and output, and we'll go into a little more detail into what that means in a bit. You are responsible for starting the runtime. This is helpful if you want to, say, test your function locally, right? If you're testing your function locally, you don't want to start the runtime, because it was kind of the reference implementation says you have to have certain environment variables available because they will give you the endpoint that you, you that you're gonna like request and fetch events from so you just you can test your function in isolation and when you're deploying to AWS Lambda somehow you you are responsible for starting the runtime it's one line of code um, this is how it looks so in this case there's a, 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 a lambda function that gets JSON and outputs JSON um, don't get too hung up on the types there. I just put them there uh, if you want to look at the slides later. But basically what is this is you, you, your function gets an event. It gets a context, which is like AWS related stuff. I don't even remember what is there. Most of the time you don't even want to do anything with that. And then you're, you're responsible for returning a result type with the output JSON. Or, you know, in this case we're returning OK because, yay, we managed to get a response JSON. But sometimes, you know, things go wrong, you want to return an error, type, an, uh, an error the error uh, constructor. And then at the end, the very last line is just uh, getting the JSON module from the Lambda runtime and starting a Lambda that uh, gets inputs over JSON and outputs over JSON. I think, and this is basically the most general Lambda that could, you could write, because everything gets JSON. Um, and then um, we provide a a couple other libraries that help um, deserialize this JSON into something that is more sensible for us that like type, uh, type safe code. So we're gonna do a little de detour, um, which is to talk about the missing piece of this talk. And the, that missing piece was, uh, is, is Zite, uh, a uh, company uh, in San Francisco and their, their product now, now, or now.sh. You might have heard about it. Um, so what, what, is, what is a Zite now? What, what is this? Um, and so basically AWS is like Lego, right? Lego pieces where you can put them together, mix and match. And, and Zite, Zite now.sh product, uh, it builds on top of AWS and others, but that's kind of outside of the scope of this talk. And then they provide an end-to-end -end integration for the things that you want to build. So they provide one URL per deployment, and this is really nice because they have this whole thing about immutable deployments where you can roll back by just pointing your deployment at the, the other URL, the previous one. Um, they also provide an HTTP proxy and allow you to route uh, certain, certain paths to different lambdas if you have, say, a monorepo with different lambda functions. 
Uh, they give you a logging dashboard. Uh, some workloads also support a zero config where you just type their command and it will deploy and figure out what it needs to do. And so this is really cool. Uh, but the key point is if we wanted to build an experience like this on AWS Lambda itself or on AWS itself, the, the whole thing, um, we'd have to put all the building blocks together. Um, an example of that is like, first thing you'd, we'd need is some compute platform for building, for building the deployment artifacts that we're going to deploy to Lambda. Second thing is a place to store them. Uh, store the built artifacts, store this, uh, or, and, and serve uh, potential static assets. Uh, and what they call an API gateway, which is basically what Zyte provi provides in the form of routing and proxying. Uh, some uh, CloudWatch, which is a AWS service for logging, either deploy uh, lambdas manually or through some homegrown CLI or the AWS CLI for coordinating all of this. Uh, we're all guilty of doing this over Bash. I'm not judging. I also do that. Um, and so the, the, the reason why I like Zyde is they wire everything together. And they make it seem that it's just another HTTP endpoint, just another HTTP service. Uh, as per their official documentation, so for each request, and this is in their Node.js offering, two objects, a request and a response, is, are passed to it. You're responsible, for, you're responsible for doing whatever you want as long as you return a response. I mean, I don't return a response. I don't care. Um, but you probably want, want to do that. In any case, these objects are the standard HTTP request and response objects in Node.js. So it, it, it just, it's familiar. And I, I like this. I, I like this a lot. So as part of the AWS Lambda OCaml runtime library, I also built a now.sh wrapper library within the same repo um, that preserves the same assumptions that they have in their docs. Um, and so in addition to this uh, raw JSON backend for the, the runtime, um, I built an, this additional library that works specifically with now.sh and adheres to the same design decisions. Um, and so it's just, it almost seems like it's just another HTTP request handler, even though it doesn't really, you're not really setting up a server. Um, so for this, I'm mostly familiar with HTTP AF, which is a library for, um, we're calling it native OCaml. Um, is there a native buckle script? Oh, there is. Oh my God. In any case. This is how an HTTP uh, Lambda function deployed to now that a stage will look. Again, don't get too hung up on the types, but basically you get a request descriptor, and the descriptor is basically something that you can get a request from, and you can start a response from. Um, and so, oh, I should have put line numbers here, but uh, the very last line of the function between, uh, uh, before the curly braces, we're just saying respond with string of the response that I built in the line above, and then the body that is either echoing the body that this gets, or just saying, oh, sorry, I didn't get an HTTP body. Cool. Everyone with me so far? Anybody asleep in the back? <laughs> oh, they're awake. Yes. All right, cool, because now it's demo time. Um, all right, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to write a lambda function, or a C one that I already wrote. Um, use GraphQL and GraphQL PPX. Who knew GraphQL PPX also works on the native side? This is so cool. Um, we're going to query the GitHub API with one graph. See, more buzzwords. Um, we're going to query the GitHub API because they expose it through GraphQL in a very nice way. Um, we're going to query it over HTTP2. One more buzzword. I'm sorry, I, I, I think this is the last one. Um, so um, I also kind of built an HTTP2 server and client in Pure OCaml a couple Ooh. months ago. Uh, I built it because I wanted to do HTTP like client stuff in OCaml and, there wa and most sites today are behind load balancers that say uh, serve HTTP2 traffic and there wasn't any. You'd have to buy, like, bind to libcurl and stuff I also like to play with unikernels, and this is not possible there because there is no Unixy stuff. I digress. Um, and then the last thing is you respond with some HTML and this Lambda function, and we're going to see how this looks like. This is all in Reason, compiler native code, uh, deployed to now.sh. And you're like, cool, where's the code? 
Um, here we go. Uh, I wonder if you can all... Ah, this is the worst part. There's a mouse. I can't even see the thing. <laughs> Almost there. <laughs> this curtain is <laughs> in the way. There we go. Yep. Awesome. Um, cool. So we're going to reach over here. And I'll make this bigger in a sec. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to make the same mistake. Um, I actually should mirror displays. Please don't show up there. Oh, okay, it showed up there. <coughs> Is this even the one a that I want? A little lower, yeah. Right here. Go, Go. to arrangement. Right. Oh. oh, other side. <laughs> this looks so much better now, and I can make the same mistake. Okay, no, it doesn't. Oh, there you go. Okay. People were asleep in the back a while ago. Can you read this? Awesome. Um, OK. Um, so this looks like any other code that you'd write, even on, on in like targeting the web. So we define some types for, oh, actually, I didn't tell you what we're going to build. Um, we're going to build this. Oh, no, not that. Um, <laughs> GitHub, stars, something like that. All right, we're going to build something that fetches the stargazers for a certain repo and prints the people who've like starred the repo. This is something very simple, but I think it, um, you know, uh, show, shows shows off what I want to show off. Basically, it's a very contrived demo. Um, so I define a type for the data that I want that I'm going to get. Um, and so what I'm going to do is like, this is a GraphQL query. I run this query to get the stargazers. Um, or they're like on a descending uh, in a descending order uh, for the you know first number of stars that I want to get, uh, and for each user I get uh, the login, uh, so the data of the username, the name of the person, and the the, the auto party URL, so like the image that is on the that picture, um, and also the total number of stars. Um, and the reason in here as well is like something that we're going to see later is. This is kind of nested, and so we're going to have to transform this into the the, the like the, the structure that I find above, and that is basically what the code here is doing. You get the GraphQL response. Um, there's a bunch of code that is querying one graph and uh, just getting a response, parsing parsing through through the, all of the response team, what's available and what's not, and just building right here, just building a response like a, 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 something in the shape that I defined earlier. I'm going to share the URL with you later, so you can just look at it on your own time. Um, they're going to throw me off the stage somewhere, who wants to. And so then we handle the results. And we basically, this is something that takes, this takes the, 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 the now, like really, not the now, let's say, the, the thing, the, the updated type of uh, data and the structure that we like, and it just builds some HTML. I feel like great future work could be built something like JSX for for native using maybe like this library. This is called Cow Camel on the web. It's like some the library that outputs HTML strings. Uh, and then, I, I mean, JSX on in recent work great right here. So if PR is welcome, move on. Yeah, and so we're basically just styling stuff and outputting some HTML. Uh, and then this is basically our lambda function, our handler, that again takes a request descriptor. Um, there's a usage uh, string here, which is like a fallback if we don't have to write arguments. And I basically put this here as like, like guardrails for myself because I never get the arguments right. Um, and yeah, and then, then as I said, we're responsible for starting the lambda, the, the lambda function. This is or starting the runtime rather uh, by passing in the handler for the request that are going to come in. Um, and so yeah, this is this is kind of already deployed to I think they don't, it might be they don't start up now that I stage. Um, the repo is there was an error getting data. Oh maybe 
I might have, well, let's do that. Like, anyway, you saw a working thing. Why don't we do something else? But anyway, just to make sure, just to make sure, I'm going to add something here and say, all right, I'm going to try this. Don't judge me uh, if it goes wrong. I want to maybe deploy this and say, there's a string, hello from reason, call the US. Probably a comments in here. Um, another piece of work that uh, needs to be done in the future uh, that I envision me doing in the future is um, so this is right now you need to stop Docker to build like a statically linked binary that gets deployed there. And the reason for that is um, this is like I'm, I'm running a Mac. And it was that it runs on Linux, and we don't know what the like potential distribution target is. So we need like something that is technically compiled because we don't know where like lib libc paths are. Anyway, uh, <laughs> nerd stuff that you don't want to care about. Stuff that I should care about and provide you all with a better experience. So in the future, like now, LibSageLi allows us to to build custom builders. And so I am planning on building, say, an easy builder that is hosted on now and just builds your code for you in the target machines. It doesn't even need to statically link. It will just handle all this for you, but this is so new that I just didn't get to it yet. Um, you know, sometimes my couch is just, you know, really, really complicated. <laughs> all right, so we should have a bootstrap file here. And this is what the now configuration is uh, designed to deploy. So we're going to try uh, deploying this. Oh, I know why that didn't work. Because I need to pass in the environment variable. Um, so to deploy the prod, this is what you get for deploying things right before you get to stage. <laughs> uh, so hopefully this one will work. Uh, if the Wi-Fi cooperates. It's stuck at 40%. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> fun fact. Like Peter wanted to say, you know, fun fact. Conference Wi-Fi sometimes sucks when you're on stage. <laughs> All right, it's the point now. So we got an immutable URL. Uh, and I, I said, like, uh, also the plug broad, so we, like, it will be at least automatically to this one, so this is the one we're going to visit. Um, and so the, oh, let me see. I, I told you I always forget what the things are, so I'm just going to do this. We can go face for reason. And hello for a reason, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> we can see that the, the reason people has like 8,000 something stars, and these are the latest people that have uh, started. If you want to show up, yeah, you've got one chance. If you want to. Show your face on the screen. You gotta go and start the user repo right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Wi-Fi, right? Yeah, I know. All right, let's keep going. Um, okay. Um, I should do some code. It comes a little weird. Uh, you can either take pictures or I will leave the link to the slides later so that you can. And I also ask the uh, I'll post them on Twitter or ask Peter to do it. Um, any case, there's certain limitations right now with um, the serverless lambda paradigm, the function as service products. Um, and so the first one is, well, it's really cool that they abstract the computer away from you and the deployment targets. You don't really have any say over what you get allocated. Um, so I think lambda right now limits the number of cores that you get to one, which is fine because the camel doesn't run on multi core yet. Anyway, but you, they also limit the, the, the memory that you get. So I think right now you get like 3 gigs of RAM. I mean, sure, this lambda runs in like, I don't know, 50 gigs of RAM? That's what's also so cool about it. You know, the memory footprint for these simple use cases is very well. Um, but it's also paradigm shift, right? You're, we're all used to thinking about, all right, you deploy this web server that needs to handle all these requests, has all these connections, does some file descriptors, some Unix stuff. Some, uh, like in Lambda, Lambda is serverless, but it, it's also meant to be stateless in that you can't keep an open connection to, say, a database. Um, or, I mean, you better not do that. Otherwise, you'll run out of database connections. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the paradigm shift also involves like 
being careful about starting a new database connection, but also like cl cl cleaning all of this up as the function is starting to tear down. Um, WebSockets, as far as I know, are not supported because you can't keep a, uh, an open connection, you especially cannot push. Uh, otherwise, you know, what would be the point of anchor in 100 milliseconds if you're going to keep a persistent thing? Um, uh, yeah, well, like database connections, but also the locality of your data. Sometimes, you know, you, you get control over, okay, this time that is running on AWS, so it might not be on my PC, it might not be, you know, inside my cluster where it's, where it's really close to my, the, where my, my program is executing, so it might be a little slower for some of these cases. The, the paper 100 milliseconds can get very expensive, very fast, and there are some horror stories on, on, on the internet about people who've, you know, deployed these like very popular lambdas that everybody else had used, and you know, they were left with the giant bill at the end of the month. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned, uh, the customer could be more delayed, frankly. In any case, is this thing ready? And like, how many people use it? Uh, well, so I made a fan diagram. <laughs> uh, this is not to scale. I assume that there aren't as many recent users as there are monthly users, but maybe there are. Um, and then even people who are in, you know, that use all of these things, I think it's like limited to one, which is me. <laughs> um, so I'm right there in a sweet spot. If you, if you want to join me, come hang out. Um, okay. So go grab it. Uh, it's on GitHub. You can install it through um, Easy or just pin it through OPAM. The probably like one person that uses OPAM in this room, and it's there. It's also the person who's on stage. Um, so again, another another intersection for that one. Then that one. All right. In conclusion, custom runtimes made it easy to run recent on AWS. Um, it's really cool because at least you know. Kind of circling back to my wife's uh, land service that I built. I can leave it running without worrying about, uh, oh no, she, like she, her product is really popular. Now I'm like I'm responsible for for her business not taking off. Um, so you know I really don't have to worry about that. Thankfully, otherwise maybe I'll get locked out. Um, in any case, I call this experiment. Please experiment. I love experimenting. I, I think that you should do. It's really fun if you you know if you if you feel like it. Um, and ship. Ship ReasonML, ship OCaml, uh, show the world that this is a viable thing that people can use and experiment and explore and have fun with. So I want to I sort of back to Jordan's question this morning. What would you like to build? Build the next thing. Thank you.